Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Ogden, Utah. My name is John Draskovic, and I'm the pastor here. This is the seventh week of Easter, the final week before Pentecost. This is the week in which we celebrate the ascension of our Lord Jesus. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in our time and space of worship today. For the members of our congregation who are spread out throughout the Wasatch Front here, and for those who may be joining us in worship from around the country, around the world, I welcome you. I just wanted to let you know that the leadership of the church here, our session, is discussing, thinking about, uh, discerning what it would look like to gather in person again. And we want to be very careful, very prudent, and to protect our congregation, and that we feel like one of the best ways to be a good steward of the congregation in which we've been entrusted to is to make sure that we're keeping their safety first and foremost. So even though we may technically be able to gather together to worship, uh, just because it's legal doesn't mean it's beneficial, to paraphrase Paul there. Um, and so we're going to continue to look at what it would look like to gather together and what kind of measures we would need to take in order to feel good and comfortable about doing that. One of the best ways that we can love our neighbor right now is by thinking about their safety first. We don't want to do more harm than we're doing good. I'd just like to, along those lines, remind you that the church is not a building. Being part of the church is being part of the body of Christ. In the original Greek language in which our New Testament was written in, they had a word that ends up getting translated church. It was called ecclesia. And the ecclesia was not a building. As a matter of fact, the root of that word goes back to Greek politics where people would gather together in one place. To do, it was a congregation of people. That's what the church is. It is a congregation of people. It's why Jesus says where two or three are gathered, I am there in your midst. And so wherever you are, whatever it is that you're called to do right now to be Christ to the world, remember that. Remember that we are the church. It's not about a place. It's not about a building. It knows no walls. But it's about God's spirit active and moving in God's people. And so let's continue to be the church. With that, I'd invite us now into a time of centering. As we hear this prelude by Margaret, morning has broken. Would you enter into this time prayerfully as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship?
Now would you join me in our call to worship taken from Psalm 47. Shout for joy, sing songs of praise, for God reigns over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout. Sound the trumpets and sing songs of praise. Let us sing together, Thine be the glory. confession and pardon this week, I'd like to read a poem that I came across by Sarah Bournes. The poem is written in uh, response to the coronavirus, and I think it's very appropriate for the time in which we find ourselves. So I'd invite you now to close your eyes if you like, or you can um, kind of just enter into this poetry and allow it to be a prayer that your heart and your soul can resonate with. We've all been exposed, not necessarily to the virus, well maybe, who even knows, but we've all been exposed by the virus. Corona is exposing us, exposing our weak sides, exposing our dark sides, exposing what normally lays far beneath the surface of our souls, hidden by the invisible masks we wear, now exposed by the masks we can't hide far enough behind. Corona is exposing our addiction to comfort, our obsession with control, our compulsion to hoard, our protection of self, our obsession with rights. Corona is peeling back our layers, tearing down our walls, 
revealing our illusions, leveling our best laid plans. Corona is exposing the gods we worship, our health, our hurry, our sense of security, our favorite lies, our secret lusts, our misplaced trust. Corona is calling everything into question. What is the church without a building? What is my worth without an income? How do we plan without certainty? How do we love despite risks? Corona is exposing me. My mindless numbing, my endless scrolling, my careless words, my fragile nerves. We've all been exposed. Our junk laid bare, our fears made known, the band-aid ripped off, the masquerade done. At this time, I'd invite you to make your confession to our Lord. Sisters and brothers, so what now after our exposure? What's left? Clean hands? Clear eyes, tender hearts. What Corona reveals, God can heal. Come, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And let us sing of God's glory now. Children's message, Teeny Weeny True King. God's people had a new land. Now they wanted a king. But God's your king, Samuel told them. He's the one who will look after you the best. No, they said, we want a real king, one we can see. God knew that a king might not be kind to his people or look after them as well as he would. But God's people didn't care. They wanted a king and they wanted him now. So God gave them a king. He was called Saul. And he seemed like a good king, at least at first. But he became proud and he stopped listening to God. He didn't obey God or love God with his whole heart. Saul can't help me with my plan, God said. I need a king who loves me, who will teach my people to love me. I need a true king. God had just the person in mind. Go to Bethlehem, God told Samuel. You'll find the new king there. Do you know where Bethlehem is? That's where Jesus was born too. Do you know that? Yeah. Samuel's job was to listen to God. He was a prophet and tell people what God said. So Samuel went to the little town of Bethlehem. God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house. Can you say Jesse? Jesse. Very good. God was going to choose one of Jesse's sons to be the new king. Jesse had seven strong sons. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very good. And there's an eight. And then there's an eighth one. Yeah, that's right. Now, in those days, if you were going to be the king, you didn't have to be the richest or the most clever, although that was always nice. You had to look like a king which meant you had to be the tallest and the strongest so you could carry the longest sword, the biggest armor, and defeat everyone. And it didn't hurt if you were quite handsome, too. Samuel asked Jesse to bring him each one of his sons in turn. So Jesse... Daddy looks like that, that purple one with the purple stripes. Yeah, he looks like a king, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. That was the oldest, the tallest, and the strongest. This must be the new king, Samuel thought. He looks like a king. But God didn't choose him. You're thinking about what he looks like on the outside, God told Samuel. I'm looking at his heart, what he's like on the inside. So Jesse showed Samuel his next oldest, tallest, and strongest son. 
But God didn't choose him either. In fact, God didn't choose any of his seven sons. Samuel said, Jesse, is is that all? Is that all of your sons? Well, he laughed. I guess there is the youngest son, but he's just the weakling of the family. He's only teeny tiny. Bring him, Samuel said. Jesse's youngest son came running up, and God spoke quietly to Samuel. This is the one. Do you know what his name was? David. David, yeah, yeah, yeah. David. He has a heart like mine, God said. It's full of love. He will help me with my secret rescue plan. And one of his children's children's children will be the king. And that king will rule the world and rule it forever. So Samuel anointed David's head with oil, which was a special way to show that you are God's chosen king. You will be the new king one day, Samuel told him. And sure enough, when he grew up, David became king. God chose David to be king because God was getting his people ready for an even greater king that was coming. Who was that? Do you know who that is? God? Jesus. Jesus? Mm-hmm. Either one because mm-hmm. there, there are three persons, but they're, but they're in one God. That, that's right. Very good. Once again, God would say, go to Bethlehem and you'll find the new king there because that's where Jesus was born. And there, one starry night in Bethlehem in the town of David, three wise men would find him. A reading from Luke 24, verses 44 through 53. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. In the first book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come down upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking up into toward heaven? This Jesus, who had been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Today, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about probably one of the most poorly remembered, celebrated, and recognized of the Christian Holy Days, Ascension. And I have to own up to you that I had these grand plans 
of celebrating or in, inviting you into the celebration of the Ascension Day by going for a hike up to Maitland's Peak and getting some nice footage of Ogden from that hike. And while uh, Jesus ascended on Ascension Day, John did not. And so I, I uh, had, to, had to own up to that, that I, my, my best laid plans did not come to fruition here. But I would like to talk to you about the Ascension all the same. And I'd like to talk to you about how it pertains to time in particular. You know, for whatever reason, we don't seem to give Ascension a lot of our attention a lot of our time, and maybe it's because it falls on a Thursday, that uniqueness of it being, we always remember Pentecost, that it's 50 days after Easter, which happens to fall on a Sunday, but Ascension happens 40 days after Easter, which puts it on a Thursday, which is always a weird time for the church. It's an odd story with Jesus floating off into the clouds, which for us modern 21st century people, we've been above the clouds, we've flown through them, we know that heaven doesn't reside just there. So it, there's a disconnect there. Well, I think part of the reason that we don't give Ascension a lot of our time and attention is because um, we forget that Ascension ties together the ministry of Jesus with the ministry of the church. It's kind of a link, a hinge that brings the two together. It plays an important role that way. And it's not an accident that we celebrate Ascension during Easter tide during the season of Easter, because it is part and parcel. It's wrapped up into the Easter mystery, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. It's all part of the same mystery. Now, for us, because we're spatio-temporal you know, beings in, created in this world, we need things to be ordered in time. But these events are actually timeless. Events like the victory that Jesus makes over death, Return to the Father, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand them in terms of chronology. Right? When you read the different pieces of the New Testament, these events seem to happen in different times even. When did Jesus actually rise from the dead? We don't really know. All we know is that he wasn't there on Sunday morning when the women showed up. When did Jesus ascend to the Father, right? We have those two. It, not only just the discrepancy between Luke and Acts, John, it almost seems to happen on that Sunday uh, Easter morning when he tells Mary he's going to ascend to be with his Father and your Father. And in the book of Hebrews, he seems to ascend almost right from the cross. The ascension and Pentecost actually used to be in the very early church, celebrated the Sunday right after Easter and then the second Sunday after that. And this is part of how we are trying to, in order to get the narrative and to understand the story, trying to wrap our heads around actually what is a timeless event. And Luke is our primary voice for the ascension. Mark has it recording in his second longer ending, but Luke is the one who makes a big deal out of it. So I want you to remember that Luke and Acts are written by the same person. They're kind of volume one and volume two of the life and the ministry of Jesus and then the life and the ministry of Jesus in and through the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke actually has the ascension in there twice. Once at the end of his gospel and once at the very beginning of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Luke uses it as a hinge, as a pivot from the gospel into the work of the church. And Luke does it in a way that's quite logical to him, but feels illogical to us as modern readers. At the very end of Luke, in chapter 24, it's quite clear that Jesus ascends to heaven on the evening of Easter Sunday, the same day as his resurrection. And then if you just flip past John and you turn to Acts chapter 1, Jesus stays for 40 days to teach his disciples and prepare them. And this has bothered some scholars for quite a while now. They start thinking that people were starting to play with the story or add things or manipulate things. They were tinkering around or maybe they didn't really know. But I would encourage you not to get stuck on this 40 days versus that day because I think Luke is doing this. He was, he was not a dumb guy. 
he knew what he was doing. He had a reason for, for doing it. And it apparently didn't bother him too much. And part of that has to do with literary form and expectations of what, what he would be doing in terms of literature at the time. But the main reason is Luke is using the timing symbolically. So Pentecost happens 50 days after Passover. Pentecost would have been the next major feast where everybody would show up at Jerusalem. Luke wanted his disciples to stick around in Jerusalem for Pentecost when everybody would be there. And so the 40 days, so this is like one kind of reason, the 40 days keeps them in Jerusalem. But there's a second, and I think this is really more getting to the point, at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus' disciples have 40 days of preparation. Both of these 40 days are powerful and symbolic because they're actually a type of what comes from before it in the Hebrew tradition. The God who called Israel through baptism of the Red Sea and prepared them for 40 years in the wilderness. is the same God who called his son in John's baptism and prepared him for 40 days in the wilderness. It's the same God who calls the new Israel, the followers of the Jewish Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, with a baptism by the Holy Spirit and preparation of 40 days with him. You see how all of this connects and lines up. And so Luke is giving us a sense of continuity between the old or that which came before and the new, that which is coming. He's binding together the past and the future. He's saying God's going to do next in line with what God has been doing in the past. He's bridging the gap and helping to guide us his readers, the followers, over the threshold. To Luke, the ascension really has these two purposes. The first is at the end of his gospel, saying Jesus is no longer the property of Judaism alone. In Acts, it's the beginning of the story of saying Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is actually now the head of the body of Christ, which knows no boundaries. And Luke knows this all along, and he's giving us little clues as we go through his gospel story that this is where the arc of it is going, but this is how he narrates it. Particularly, the last line of the gospel has the apostles returning to the temple in Jerusalem, worshiping God, which is the same place, ironically, that Luke starts his gospel, with Zechariah receiving a word from the angel Gabriel. And so the story of Jesus in Luke starts and ends in the temple in Jerusalem. But that's not where the whole story ends for Luke. In the book of Acts, Jesus is sending his disciples out to the ends of the world. Because the church's story couldn't just end in Jerusalem. The story of the church is the story of a religion that can't be contained and confined to the temple. To any temple. And it's a kingdom that knows no boundaries. So the big question that the disciples ask, Lord, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Again, about the time. And to this question, Jesus responds, It's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I want to just lift up really quick a note here about holding a tension, holding a balance between two uh, opposites that we're going to be pulled towards here. On the one hand, there has been, for whatever reason, in Christian history, in our tradition, uh, a pull, if you will, a preoccupation with trying to uh, look towards the end of the times, the second coming of Jesus, particularly with reading the signs and being able to predict the signs of the times. And this tends to be a distortion of Christianity, especially when you see it played out to its extreme. 
even after Jesus tells him it's not for you to know the time, what happens? He ascends and they stand there looking up into heaven, waiting for him to come back. He tells them, don't do this, and yet here they are watching and waiting. And so, two angelic beings have to show up and say, hey, men of Galilee, what are you doing? He's not, he's not going to come back and you're going to miss it. Trust me, you'll know when he shows up. It's time to get busy with the task that he gave you. So that's the temptation on the one side. On the other side, there is the throwing out of the expectation of the second coming of the kingdom and instead thinking that we have to bring or build the kingdom ourselves. And what Luke is saying is don't let go of the expectation of Jesus' return of the coming kingdom, but it's God's kingdom and only God brings his kingdom. Our job is to prepare for the kingdom. Live into it and live by the way, the conditions, the rules, the uh, orientation that God has set for us as we live into the kingdom now. Remove, maybe we can remove some of the obstacles to it, but ultimately we don't bring it and ultimately we don't build it. It's God who does that. Our task is to bear witness, to proclaim, and to live it out. That's essentially what bearing witness is. It's what you do with your words and what you do with your actions. Right now, we're in the in-between times. Maybe you've heard it called the already but not yet. A liminal or a threshold space where we get to be a foretaste of that kingdom that will come. A signpost that's pointing to where things are heading. And dissension actually marks the end of one phase and the beginning of of another. Ascension marks an in-between time. Ascension is a liminal space, a threshold between what was and what is still to be. A transition where we're moving out of the past and into the future, but we're not quite there yet. Now, if we're not in a liminal or threshold time right now where we've moved out of the old but still don't know exactly where we're going and what that's going to look like, I don't know what is. There's a, a sociologist who studies the church named Phyllis Tickle. Great name, by the way, right? Well, um, she said that every 500 years, the church has experienced a great shakeup, a disruption. The first 500 years was the falling apart of the, the Holy Roman Empire. The second 500 years was the split between East and West. The third 500 year shakeup was the Reformation, which started in Europe and spread out throughout the world. And guess what? We're in the middle of the next phase of shakeup of disruption. This all was going on before COVID ever happened. I think the coronavirus just exacerbated. It made more clear and obvious that we're in this liminal threshold space. Unfortunately, these periods, they don't last a year or two. They tend to last decades, if not centuries, before the dust settles and we figure out where we're going. Now, we have kind of gotten used to the new normal where we are. You know, you have to wear a mask when you're going out. You can't shake hands with people anymore. You have to social distance. The, the whole six-foot thing, we're used to seeing marks of tape on the floor at the grocery store so we know how far we need to stand behind the person in front of us, or at least how far we're supposed to. We get social uh, quarantining, but we know it's not the final destination. We know that we're in the time of transition, that we've left the old normal behind, but we have not found the new normal. And I'm thinking particularly about the calls to get back to normal, the calls to get the economy up and running again, the calls to get back to church the way it was. 
maybe ascension can give us a lens that we can see our situation through that might be helpful and beneficial and fruitful for us. Maybe we don't want to go back to the way things were. Maybe we're being called forward into something new. Now, our temptation may be to keep looking up, to wait until things come back, until the past returns. But then suddenly there are two men in white robes asking up why we're looking to the past. We have real work that we've been called to do here and now, moving forward into the future. And there's hope and there's promise of something new coming. Jesus tells us that we will receive power for this task, for being his witness throughout the ends of the earth. And then there's this funny little line, which there are a lot of funny little lines that don't necessarily make sense uh, upon first sight. But right at the end of Luke's gospel, as Jesus was being taken up, he lifts his hands and he blesses the disciples. And somehow, his blessing happens in tandem with his departure. So let me leave you with this question to ponder. As we're in the time of transition and insecurity unknown of the future. This time that's so marked by absence of church, of family, of friends, of our normal social relationships. I'd like you to consider that it could be that Jesus is also blessing us at this time, and we may not even be aware of it. Could it be that we have been or will be given the power to bear witness to him in a new way, in a new world that we are not even aware of yet? Our job is just to live into and figure out what that new world is going to be. May God's Holy Spirit, which will soon descend upon his church in a powerful way, continue to guide us as we discern together what the new thing, the new way of bearing witness to Jesus' love, mercy, and grace will be in the new world that we're not even aware is coming. Remembering the whole time that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father and sits there in glory and power, directing all things, to their final end. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of crucifixion, resurrection, and dissension. We thank you that even in the midst of unknown, uncertain times of transition and turmoil, that you are blessing us. You're bringing power that we may bear witness. Lord, give us power to live as your people, whether we're in a building or not. Lord, give us power to live self-sacrificial lives, that we don't uh, implore our rights, that we don't insist upon getting our way, but we submit and empty ourselves for the sake of your world, just as Jesus did and as you call us to do, as your faithful have done over the generations. Lord, may you bless us and give us power for this high calling and this great task on this day until you come again. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us sing together, This is my Father's world.
Would you join me in a time of prayer for our community, for our world, for those who are sick, struggling, for those who are serving now? Let's pray together. God has given us the gift of Christ, risen and ascended for the life of the world. Therefore, let us, as God's people, called and sent forth to bear witness to him, offer our gifts in return, that others may know this liberating and glorious news. As you hear this song of blessing and offering made by our Hawaiian brothers and sisters, I encourage you to give of yourself as a blessing to the church and to the world, to your neighborhood and community, wherever you may be.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And now, as we conclude our time, worship, may you remember that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. May you remember that you have been blessed and given power. May you remember that God is present, even though we may not have awareness of it. May you seek out 
the blessings of the Lord so that you may be a blessing to this world. And may you remember that wherever you are, Christ is there with you, ministering to the world through you. And may you be witnesses to the work that our Lord Jesus is doing to bring good out of even the most desperate and dark of times. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you on this day unto the ends of the ages. Amen. God be with you till we